experience of meeting him and being forgiven of their many sins have the experience of the Father's love. So whatever happens, they will not forsake or doubt the Father's love. But if you don't know, first of all, that you are a sinner, and the result of your sin, the sin that you inherit in your spirit from Adam, and the sin that you committed with your own body, with your thoughts, and with your words, with your heart, that you deserve to go to hell. That it's not like after you, after you, you guys are worse than me. I'm the, I'm the last one in line. No, it's more like I'm the first in line. If that's your confession, then you realize amazing his grace is to save the wretch like me. That by believing, by receiving his blood, that my sins have been wiped away, cleansed, washed away. Washed away. Like that song goes, washed away and not a trace is left. Not a trace is left. So I'm guilty and guilty and guilty, one, two, one thousand percent. But by his precious blood, a drop of blood, cleanse all my sins, there's not even a trace. You need to have that experience of forgiveness to fully experience the Father's love for you. Even though the son, as he returns home, may not recognize in the father. I remember seeing a news. We were already in New York, but I remember the first reunion thing that they had in Korea. South Korean and North Korea families being united on live TV. And um, I remember watching some of it in New York when we were living here. And I was just like glued to TV, like because we had never seen that. Like I remember, because I was born in Korea, grew up, and uh, heard about you know North Korea is our enemy. We gotta destroy them. Blah blah blah. We were doing silent, uh, siren uh, drill, the bomb drills back in the day. Do you want to do the bomb drill? <laughs> yeah, you're old. Yeah, <laughs> you're my generation. Yeah, um, I remember when we were little in elementary school, the siren would go off, and then we'll do a drill. Um, so to, to see, like, the, the, the reunion of the families together was, like, shocking. So they would show this, like, um, a, aged parents from North Korea being brought to this neutral location with their children, like, being brought together. And the, the, the cameras are all ready, and people are standing there. And they're coming together. The children who are, like, now, like, I don't know, in their 30s or something, like, or 40s, they can't really recognize their parents because it's been a long time. But the aging parents in their 60s, 70s, or even 80s, they find their kids. They're all wrinkled and gray or not even much hair left, but they find their kids. And they're sobbing. Like, they've been apart for, like, decades. And then, like, they, like they've, they haven't seen, like, a week or something. Like, you know, they, the last time they saw was, like, a week ago or something. But they have not. It's been, like, decades since they were apart. But it's like they never parted. That there's that... That's why it's called blood being thicker than water. And the father's heart is like, that's my child. And I remember everyone crying watching that because it was so moving. And they're just sobbing and wailing and hugging and just crying because, like, they never thought that North and Korea could ever meet again. I mean, there, there are still definitely many, many families that are still divided and perish even during this time. But these few chosen ones were able to do that. So the, the moment the prodigal son returns home, the father who's been waiting recognizes his son, even though the son does not look like what he looked like when he was living under the father's roof. But the father opens his arms and receives him, as the son does not even expect that. The son says, I will be a servant because I hurt your feelings. I blew your money. I brought pains to you, and I'm a disappointment to you. Let me just work for you so I could eat. But the father wants nothing more than to have his son back in his arms. So it's really hard for us children to fully understand the father's heart. Especially for those of you perhaps in this room, and I know some people out, not here, but who grew up not knowing who their dad is. I remember someone saying, like, they saw their dad once. 
I mean, it was not even like coming to them. Like this man was just in the background. And then he was shown, that's your dad. But the dad never even said hello to the son. So this concept of father can be very far for someone like that. And not even like comfortable to say the word father. Because they've actually never used that word. But then there are those who use the word daddy, daddy all the time. So we come from different background and different um, life experience and hurts and relationships. But what we all have to make, establish, is this relationship with our Heavenly Father, our Father in heaven, as his child, as a soul who receives his blood that is spirit, that is eternal. And that totally changes my life, my heart. I was once a child of the devil of the world, but now I'm a child of God. And that I have this right to ask and expect to receive because he is my father. He is our father in heaven. And this can be a sweet sound to those who are in desperate situation. People who are like spoiled and living a comfortable life and everything going well their way. They don't pay attention to the father. They don't pay attention to the father's love, father's house. But when everything runs out and there's no one to care for them and no one to come through, no help can, can help them. And then they hear that the father is waiting for you. You have a home. He's your father. And that's the one that we cry out to, father. You know, Pastor Kang preached on Lord's Prayer many, many times, and this is the message that changed my life. It's, um, you know, uh, Pastor Ken was not always pastor, but she became a pastor unintended, unintendedly, unintended, with, uh, without plan. She had no intention of becoming a pastor, but when she founded COJ 36, 7 years ago, and before that, she was already a full-time minister. She just didn't have the, she was not ordained yet, or she didn't have the title. But my life changed. My sister and my life, my father, our family changed because of her. And because she is just literally living by, like, literal interpretation of the Bible. So lay down your family, your husband, your wife, or your children, whatever. She did literally that. So she was not available as we were going through uh, our puberty, you know. So she was not even uh, around for first three years when we first came to New York. And it was just so hard, but then I was God-fearing always. And that's one thing that I had that carried me to this day. Even as a child, I was God-fearing. So I did not want to say anything that God may get upset at me about. So if I complain about mom not being around and always for Jesus, Jesus in church, maybe God would punish me. Like I had that part of me. So I would say, I hope it's going well with God's business over there, mom. <laughs> I would write a letter. And it was very difficult. So when I was in, uh, in, in teenage years and I did not like go out more outwardly, like my sister who was more rebellious because she's a younger, you know, I'm the older. But deep inside, I was very angry too. I was resentful. And I was just looking for my own chance to get out because I realized, like, this is, like, not what I want. Like, why all the people expect expectation? Church was so hard back in the day. We didn't have our own building. We were persecuted all the time. Pastor Kim was persecuted because she's a woman, woman pastor, preaching about Holy Spirit, baptism, being a Baptist, being Holy Spirit, and driving out demons. She was not even driving out demons all the time. But all those things, they were all saying, all the communities around and whatever, they were persecuting our church a lot and a lot of trouble in the early stage of church. It was very difficult. And I just don't want to be part of it. So I remember, like, planning out my college time. You're like, I'm leaving. Like, I'm done. I'm done with the Sunday school. I'm done playing the piano. I'm done. Because, like, it's a legitimate time to leave. I'm going away far away. So I was going to go to, like, upstate, one of the SUNYs, like, really far away. But then I needed a signature back in the day. There's no electronic stuff that you guys do now. You, you send in a portal. <laughs> You literally had to get Mama's John Hancock. Like you need her signature or Papa's. So I gave it to her, and she was just 
you know how she is, like, <laughs> my way or highway, yeah, the same way, you, you, you see what you, you, get what you get, you get what you see, you get what you get, so whatever you see from the pulpit, well, is what you get at home, so she was literally that, she was saying, like, I am not going to sign anything if you go away from, far away from church and you don't come back every weekend, no, no, before that, I don't have a dime to pay for your tuition, I think I should have been like smart and be like, okay, so you don't have a dime, so like what right do you have to tell me what to do? <laughs> but, but I was, again, still like, so she was saying, I don't have a dime to give you, but I tell you that if you don't um, come back every weekend, I'm going to cut you. I'm going to cut you off, literally. I'm going to cut you off from what? You have money that you may cut off? Like nothing. Like I was, basically we were on our own. I mean, we had roof over our heads, but we had to get our jobs. We were working all the time to support ourselves, to for our personal stuff. We had to do all that. So she's saying all this. And um, what she said was really shocking that night was that you cannot expect to do everything your way and expect God to to let you be. Like as in, how do you expect God to be on your side if you do you go on your way? You do your way. And that scared me that night. Like I realized, and I couldn't sleep all night. I was so mad, so angry. And then I realized, if I, I, I've been plotting this. Like this was my secret plan, like escape route. And what, what if God is not happy? And I think that's the blessing God gave me, that there's a part of me that always feared God, even as a child. And a few days later, we went to Friday prayer service, and she was doing the Lord's Prayer a series. This was a long time ago, guys, and she was preaching this message. And I don't remember anything. When I was preparing for this, like, I don't remember any of this. But she made us realize that the one in heaven is our Father, and that you cry out to him in times of need. Because he shed his, play, his blood for you, and you have heaven as your home waiting for you. So from earth, from the time between earth and heaven, you're going to have needs. You're going to be in desperate situation. You're going to be lonely. You're going to go through hardship. You're going to face battles. And the only way you can do that is by calling Father. And I remember, like, for the first time, I didn't care. Because usually I was like, I don't want her to be happy by me crying. Like, if I cry, she's going to be happy. Like, I don't want that. So, like, passive aggressive. It's like, mm, you know. <laughs> but that night, I, yeah, we turned off the light. I forget. It was like Ang Ang Anglewood Cliff or something. Like that. We were renting a church there, and we were all down, and everyone was crying father. And I, I, when I received the Holy Spirit when I was really young, and I was baptized then, too. I was very naive because Susan, my dad was born in New York, and we were split so um, apart. So I was very sad, and. Pastor Kang became a hallelujah lady, and we missed her a lot. We were still young in Korea. And I remember there was this, like, fired up preacher for children ministry. He was, like, really fired up Sunday school um, evangelist. So we learned a lot from him. He was like, call up Father 5,000, 500,000 or 500 times or something like that. So I already experienced, like, a, like a juvenile level of that. But here is, like, as a now becoming a young adult, uh, for the first time, I cried out, Father. And I couldn't stop crying. Like, my heart just broke. And I just felt like I had this weight, like, I did not realize I had. And this anger and this sadness and resentment and, and fear and anxiety. All of that was just, like, being lifted up as being unlo unloaded and lifted up. So after the prayer meeting was done, my face was like so swollen. My eyes were so swollen and bloodshot. Like I, I don't remember I was crying that much. But still, I did not want Pastor Kang to see. So I was just like, <laughs> but she um, already knew. But it was the beginning where uh, my heart started to change. So when I think about Father, it's like I, even now, in times where I need to pray for a situation or just very frustrated or just don't have any, I, couldn't, I can't even come up with words to say. Now I can say Yeshua because it's actually the name of the Father. So even if I don't get to say Father when I'm saying Yeshua, I know that he's my Father. But we all ought to have that experience of crying out Father and being broken to 10,000 pieces. 
because I miss him. I miss him. I don't know where that comes from. And my physical father has now passed many years already. It's not that. It's not like I'm, I, my dad died, so I miss God. No, it's not like that. Even when he was alive, this was true. So it's got nothing to do with your earthly relationship. But if you're truly born again and you have the experience of confessing that you are a sinner deserving the fire of hell because of your many, many, many sins that God saw, as I said earlier on today, he was there when you did those disgusting things, the detestable, embarrassing things that you would never even want to think about. He was there. He saw everything. He saw even before you carried into action when the evil thoughts sat in your mind, in your heart, all those things. He was there. Yet it is he who shed his precious blood for you to give birth to you as his child. So how can you not be moved? If we were to project on the, on, on the PowerPoint here of all the things that you've done. No, no, not, not all the things. Let's just talk about yesterday or today. All the things that you have thought of projected. You would not have even one friend in this room left. Nobody would want to be your friend. But there is our Heavenly Father who decided to be our Father and shed his precious blood for you, for me. And he waited patiently for us to one by one come home to him. Prodigals returning home. There's still some of you who are being prodigals. You say you were saved and you were forgiven, but you still have a rebellious prodigal heart. It's time for you to come home. It's time for you to come home. Even if you heard this many, many times, but you never shed a tear. Or maybe you did shed a tear, but it's just like, <sighs> I'm not tearful. Mourning is like, as Pastor Kang said, it's like somewhere, like inside your head. Deep inside, deep inside. It's just pouring, pouring out, pouring out. And I experience that every day now because I'm mourning. As Pastor Kenny has said, blessed are, the, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. So mourning first of my sins and my sinfulness and my lack of faith and my doubts. How still carnal and worldly I am and all that. But on top of that, more and more. Now because I know him more, I'm mourning more. How can it be? God like you can reveal yourself to me. God like you that I can know and not only know in the head, but experience that you are our father in heaven. How can that not cause you to shed your tears? How can that not drive you to forgive the most unforgettable, unforgivable brother of yours? How can you still be grudging and avoiding your brother? And I don't want to see her. I don't want to be in the same group as her. Send her away. Send him away. I don't want to be. Move me. I don't want to be with them in the same room. And you say, our father. As I had said earlier, think about the our. Think about the father. Think about the father's heart, the father's eyes on you. This image of him holding the universe. And you're there. Your life is there like a dot. Like a speck of dust. Here but gone in a second. But in this split second of time, this fleeing moment with respect to the history of the universe, I heard about God. I heard about the creator coming as man. To be broken and spilled out to give birth to me. A soul that deserved to go to hell. So while I'm on earth until I go home in heaven, I can cry out, Father. Let's close our eyes and say together, Father. A little bit more meaningfully, how about? Father. Father. Once again, Father. I want you to get used to that. Even if you never use the word father or daddy in your life, he's your eternal father in heaven. 
Let's pray. Even if science cannot confirm my relationship with him as my father and I as his child, I know that he is my father. I can never forget the experience of being born again as child and returning to him. That experience should be so powerful and and life changing that no matter what happens in your life, you cannot turn back. You cannot give up. Nothing can stop you. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, from the love of our heavenly father. Yet you doubt. Yet you complain. Yet you hold grudges against him or his other children, your brothers, your sisters. I'm sorry for this prodigal heart of mine. I don't know what is wrong with me. I am just hopeless. Yet you give me another chance right now, right here in this place. To be reminded of your perfect love, Father. Oh, I need you. I need you, Father. I want to return to you. Raise your hands to heaven and call him, Father. Don't say anything else, but 